thank you all very much for coming. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for this year's Alumni Distinguished Lecture. But before joining the ranks of our alumni, our speaker came to us with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. Notice how I try to pronounce the Enya there. Uh, he uh, pursued his doctoral work under the direction of Carlos de Ganzo. Uh, the work entailed the development of a system for controlling and coordinating the movements of multiple buses running on common routes. The idea was to try and assist bus agencies to do a better job in keeping their buses on schedule. Now the research was an exceptionally fine piece of work, but there are two caveats that need to be added here. The first caveat is something that today's speaker himself wants you to know. And that is, he wants you to know that uh, working on his uh, research on automated bus control was not the only thing that kept him busy as a Berkeley PhD student. To the contrary, he wants to make it clear that each and every single year of his PhD studies, he also won our campus's intramural basketball championship, <laughs> which I guess goes to show you that the Spanish are pretty good at basketball, or as they like to say, baloncesto because the problem with the Spanish is they seem to have a different word for everything. Uh, but that also goes to show you that each speaker was a, that today's speaker was able to blend his high-level doctoral studies with rather serious athletic competition. But that's not the only thing that our speaker was able to blend together, which brings us to the second caveat, and this is something that I wanted to mention. Um, and it's this, our speaker's doctoral work produced beautiful theory but did not stop there. Uh, to the contrary, before even completing his doctoral work, our speaker co-founded a startup called Via Analytics, which was dedicated to using his ideas to improve the performance of real-world public transit systems. To that end, he led in the development and implementation of some of his control ideas and some of his ideas for extracting analytics. The system has been deployed by a number of bus companies in the US and Europe to much acclaim. Now, at first blush, you might be rightly impressed by our speaker's ability to blend together the theoretical with the applied. But in fact, our speaker has blended together things that are in fact more subtle and perhaps even more important. Because what I would say first and foremost about our speaker is that he blends together expertise in technology along with expertise on how transportation components work and how these components can be fit together in optimal fashion uh, to serve society best. In my own experience, this blended expertise of both technology and transportation science is something very rare, and it is through this rare blended knowledge that technology, with all its promise, might be applied to transport systems in ways that actually serve society productively. So then, it is very good news that our speaker today has been applying his blended expertise in technology and transportation science in other endeavors. Most recently, he joined Uber's Advanced Technology Group as a research lead, where he now heads a team of data scientists who are using big data and geospatial analysis and simulation techniques to serve not only the broader interests of Uber, but also of society. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce and to welcome back our distinguished speaker. Check out my pronunciation here. I'm welcome to the stage, Dr. Juan Argote Caballero. Vamos. Thank you, Mark. So, good. Okay. Well, Mike, thank you for uh, your kind works, and also thanks, uh, Professor Stacy, for inviting me to provide this lecture. It's a true honor to be here today and to have had the chance to interact with the amazing faculty and students at UC Berkeley. Uh, the talk that I'm going to give today right, is going to focus first on providing an overview of uh, self-driving technology and then on uh, assessing the pathway towards its widespread implementation. But before doing so, I want to start with my personal path, something that Mike alluded to, and I want to provide uh, a story behind the realization that brought me to focus on self-driving technology. And to do that, I'm going to look at public transportation operations and the role that autonomy could actually play in, within, within that framework. Now, there's one thing that I want to note, and that is that the, the work that I'm going to be presenting here in this initial part of the talk is work that I completed prior to joining Uber ATG, uh, and that it is separate from the work that the company is 
carrying out with some of the public agencies uh, and operators in the field. But without further ado, I'm going to start by presenting this picture here. I'm sure that if you have ever uh, taken the bus, you've come across something similar to this. This is bus bunching, and it's an event that occurs when you have two buses from the same line arrive at the same stop simultaneously. And it is a very telling sign of the complexity and the challenges that public transit operations uh, face all around the world. So to look at uh, the mechanisms behind, behind bunching, I'm going to use uh, this figure here, which is widely known in transportation engineering as a, a time-space diagram, which illustrates, and it's very useful, to uh, represent the motion of vehicles, in this case buses, along a certain route. So you can see here the motion of four conventionally operated buses uh, that are completing service along a route that's about 4.5 kilometers long. And you can see how, as the buses reach the end of the line, they reappear at the beginning. And there's uh, certain problems that are very apparent. One of them is this bunching event that occurs when two uh, of these trajectories uh, confluence, they, they get together, they come together. And that has uh, very negative uh, effects on the service that it's then uh, received by our users. You, you have the incidence or the, uh, the appearance of these like, this large gaps uh, in service that result in long wait times and this perception of uh, bad uh, or poor uh, uh, user experience, poor service. And so bunching uh, occurs because uh, buses in a, in a conventionally operated bus system are subject to a couple of sources of randomness. The first source is uh, traffic. So due to the interactions with the vehicles around, uh, around the buses, as well as, as the interactions with the traffic lights. And the second source is uh, caused by the, the presence of demand along the route and these boarding and alighting uh, 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 processes that are not only affected by the demand on the route, but also by the motion of the vehicles around these, these buses, like the same, the same buses on the, on the line. Now in conventional operations, bus drivers have a limited amount of information that they can use to counteract these randomness sources. And so the work that we did here at, uh, at UC Berkeley actually conceived the, what, what it would be possible if you could potentially automate the driving task and apply continuously and automatically apply a control mechanism that would counteract uh, these sources of randomness. And you can think about this as if effectively you were placing springs in between the buses so that you could keep, keep them like evenly spaced and you can also put a spring between the buses under desired underlying schedule. Now, these springs also have a, a strength that you can tweak uh, and that plays a huge role on the output uh, of, this, of these control strategies. Now, after we conceived the concept of this like continuously and automatically applied control, we tested it via parametric models and uh, simulations and we saw what, what it is that we could achieve. You can see here the picture on the bottom how this system would perform under this type of uh, operations. And you can tell that the, the operations are much more regular. And even though the, the buses are still subject to, the, to this traffic disruptions and these sources sort of uh, randomness, you, you have a much more, much more regular service. Now, as Mike alluded, we didn't stop here. We decided to actually carry out the implementation in the real world. Now, at the time, we didn't have the possibility of partnering with autonomous shuttles. So what we did was partnering, we partnered with multiple agencies uh, around the world so that we could test uh, the implementation of this control with a human in the loop. So we, were, we had to pass the recommendations of, uh, of the control to these drivers so that they could operate, as you can see here on the left, uh, in, the, in the real world, and we did that with a system of onboard tablets. Now, one aspect that I want to highlight uh, of that implementation is the fact that because we had to implement this through uh, human drivers, we have to conceive a very simple yet intuitive user interface so that we pass along these auto automated like recommendations to them. So you can see here that we did, we did so in two modes. On the top, you have the recommendations that the drivers would see while driving in between stations, uh, just a floating bar that would indicate how far ahead or behind they were from their optimal position. And then at the bottom, we have a countdown that would only pop up at certain instances whenever necessary to slow some of these drivers uh, a little farther down. Now, obviously, we, uh, we wanted to test how this control performed in the field. But the first thing that we did, as you would normally do in an experimental setup, is to come up with like, uh, the status quo and monitor uh, business as usual. So we did that. We um, 
We monitor this unreliability index that gives you a sense uh, of the quality of operations from a reliability standpoint. And uh, we observe that the, the average reliability and reliability index, and I want to note unreliability, uh, I along the line uh, in which we activated the control was about 150 seconds. And it is important to note that this, this is a concept of unreliability because what you're, what you're trying to do here is lower the bar as much as possible. Like get it as close to zero, even though zero is not, not possible because of all these randomness sources that I discussed earlier. Now, after doing so, we also conducted simulations of the control. And you will note here that in this diagram, we have a control, the notion of a control strength on the horizontal axis. So that is something that is tied to the actual magnitude of the recommendations that the drivers would see. So the, the stronger the control, the better uh, the reliability level that you could achieve, but also the higher the, the potential countdowns that these drivers would see. And because of that, we decided to start our initial implementation with a light control setup, control strength setup, I must, I must say. Uh, and so the results that we obtained were actually fantastic. They were really good. They pretty much uh, were exactly to what we were expecting based on our simulations. And that was tremendously encouraging. Uh, based on these results, we discussed with the agency the possibility of increasing the, the strength of the control to see if we could reach uh, better levels of reliability through the route. And we decided to increase the control strength up to like that point, the 0 0.5 point, where you start getting diminishing returns by increasing the strength of the control. And after we did that, the results were not so great. Like we actually observe uh, quite a substantial gap between what it is that we were expecting and what was actually taking place in the field. So I have to say that we were initially a little bit puzzled what, what's going on here. Like we tested multiple uh, potential reasons and eventually we came across the actual answer, which was the fact that driver compliance with that uh, high yeah, control <laughs> Uh, strength setup was actually fairly low. You can see here in this diagram, this scatter plot that represents, uh, it's an assessment of the behaviors of the drivers. So you, on the horizontal axis, you have the percentage of times in which they decided to ignore the control recommendations that we were giving them, which goes all the way up to 85%. And on the vertical axis, <laughs> yeah, you have the average intensity of that infringement in seconds. So you can see that there's clearly a gradation of behaviors, but there's obviously a very like, visible population towards the end here. This type of drivers that no matter what it is that you tell them, like they're just going to ignore your recommendations and do whatever it is that they want to do. There's a gradation here, and obviously some of these drivers were actually pretty good. You know? They were willing to like, pay attention to recom their recommendations and, uh, uh, and listen, and, and actually, I mean, they, they ignore those in five, 10 percent of the time. Well, there may be like some factors at play that we'll, we'll see shortly. But the key aspect here is that if this control application were to be like truly automated, what you should see is just this point. There shouldn't be any scatter. There should be nothing except for a point, all at zero percentage of infringement and zero average infringement intensity. And the results that we could have collected would have been much better in terms of performance of the system. And so. The factors I was alluding to, the factors at play here, and uh, you can see like one of them is, prob is highly probable that some of these infringements were related to distractions. Like this is pretty much human nature. Like I'm sure that you've all done this at some point. I've done it. I'm uh, culpable of doing this, like checking the phone. So yeah, there there could be uh, instances of distraction at play. Now that I don't think could explain this more pervasive behavior that that we can see towards the extreme of that uh, scatter plot, and that can be tied to probably like some other cognitive biases that affect us humans. Like the, the fact that we have a tendency to overestimate our competence. This could be a play here. In fact, in our discussions with, with drivers, some of the drivers actually were, were pretty, pretty blunt about it in telling us that like, I've been doing this job for many years. I know exactly how to drive. I can adapt my driving. I don't need to obey any of your rules. So there's, uh, yeah, you can, you can see that there's uh, certain human tendencies at play here. And you know who doesn't have any of these cognitive biases. I'm, I'm sure that you know where I'm going with this. Well, our robot friends here, you know, these uh, are yeah, certainly not, uh, not affected by, by any of this. And so, enter self-driving technology. Um, up, up until this point, I've, I've been doing a little overview of the potential of automation in the context of uh, public transportation. Now I'm going to like, go a little deeper in, into how the technology works so that I can provide a, a sense of like, the inner workings of the tech and then give you uh, an idea of uh, some of the challenges that lie ahead in terms of its implementation. And so 
To do so, I'm going to start by looking at our current uh, XC90 uh, Volvo vehicle platform. This, as you can see, looks like pretty much the same as a conventional vehicle, but I can tell you that it is packed to the brim with like sensing capabilities. Um, you, can, you can appreciate like the, the, probably the most distinctive feature is the wing at the top of the vehicle. So on top of that wing, there's a LiDAR that is mounted. That LiDAR provides a 360 degree, three dimensional scan of the surroundings of the vehicle continuously via light laser pulses. And so we have uh, very good uh, capabilities to like localize objects around the vehicle. And that information is actually complemented with the forward side and rear facing cameras that are equipped on the bottom of that wing. Those cameras add color to the scene. And what do I mean by that? Well, to illustrate that, consider the, the, the problem of like, identifying and, uh, and localizing a, a traffic signal. The LiDAR does a very good job at locating that particular signal in the scene, but the cameras are then used to assess the status of the signal. Is the signal red, yellow, green? So that's where the cameras play a substantial role. If we keep going down, we can see the 360-degree uh, radar uh, coverage that we have, which adds another layer uh, of sensing and provides information in terms of uh, being able to identify actors at longer ranges and also assessing the, the speed of these actors uh, in high, with high accuracy. And then the final, the final element here is this uh, communication antenna capabilities and, and GPS positioning, which is used in the, in the localization layers. Now, all of this sensing information is actually used by a thinking layer that it's contained within the customly designed compute that it actually sits in, in, the, in the trunk of the vehicle. So it, it, everything is like housed, both the memory and the compute are housed uh, inside, inside the vehicle in a way that it's not uh, obtrusive. And all, all of that compute is used to combine all of this information and then uh, build up a, a, an optimal trajectory plan for the self-driving vehicle and pass that into the, the controls of the vehicle through a gateway module that is in charge of like actuating like the, the accelerometer, the, the brakes, the, uh, turning the, the steering wheel and so on. Okay, so from here, we're gonna, we're gonna look at how all of this uh, hardware is actually used within the system ar architecture. So the first thing that is important to note is that underneath all of this functionality, there's a map layer, a high definition map layer that provides the static context of each one of these scenes. And it is very, we'll see why it, it, it's very useful uh, in this entire architecture. Now, that map information is combined with the information that we receive from the sensors into a first layer of thinking, that is the perception layer, where like all of that information is used to assess the dynamic agents that are around of the vehicle. And not only assess like their position, but also categorize them. So uh, determining whether like these are cars, trucks, bicyclists, pedestrians, and all of that. Like once you have a, a good notion of the actors that are around the vehicle. You can pass that into the prediction layer that uses uh, the underlying models that we have so that we can add behavior to those agents. We can uh, project their trajectories in the future. And then once we have that, that is passed along to the motion planning system that uses the underlying plan for the vehicle and combines those sources of information to come up with an optimal trajectory that eventually is fed into the vehicle controls so that the vehicle can uh, perform whatever it is that the, the motion planning wanted to do. So that's the, uh, the system architecture. I'm going to use a very, a very simple uh, driving scenario here to kind of illustrate how this plays out. So you can see here uh, an SDB that is going on the, on the right-hand lane, and then a vehicle that is trying to merge into the lane. And we're going to see like step-by-step step how this all plays out into the, the architecture that we, that we just reviewed. So as I was saying earlier, the cornerstone of this system is the underlying high-definition map because that provides uh, kind of a layer, a static layer, a, a frame of reference that the vehicle can use to optimize the compute. So it doesn't have to spend a ton of effort like understanding what it is that's surrounding it that are uh, like the static elements around. And it can just devote all of that compute into the task of determining like what it is that the dynamic actors are going to do uh, around it. And so that's the, the, the initial layer. Now that, as I was mentioning, that map information is then combined with like the multiple uh, sources of uh, sensor data to then perceive and categorize like these this agents here. So you can see here how both LiDAR, camera, and radar information are, be are being used, and they're fused together 
to develop that intuition of what it is that's surrounding the vehicle in, in real time. Now, once you have that clear picture, you can then uh, start applying the, the underlying uh, behavioral models to understand or predict the trajectories that they're going to follow. And in this particular case, initially, you're going to perceive that the, the vehicle has an intention of like going straight. And eventually, once it starts turning, you start processing that information, you're going to transition into a trajectory that has the vehicle like o occupying your own lane. Now, from a motion planning standpoint, you want to keep like you want to stay on your on your own lane, but you also want to do that in a way that it's safe and that keeps a uh, safety distance with that vehicle. So we're going to see how the motion planning takes into account the expected trajectory for, for, for uh, the vehicle to the site and eventually translate that into a speed reduction and uh, so that it can, it can like maintain that, that safety distance. And then the final thing, as you would expect, is how do you go about executing that, uh, that trajectory? And that's via the, the actuation and, uh, and control. And in this particular case, it's a combination of just applying the brakes and then uh, accelerating back again so that you can like, uh, enter this, like, um, this mode of uh, car following here. So yeah, so this, this should give you, uh, I think, a, a pretty like, detailed overview of how the, the technology is currently implemented and how the stack works. And now I'm going to actually take a step back and transition from like, the notion of an individual vehicle and how the technology works at the individual level into like, the more like, system level implementation, a system of uh, autonomous vehicles. Now, it is important to note that in current deployments are like, relatively small scale and they're, uh, they're m mostly devoted to the development of the technology. So, so you can see pictures very similar to the one that you have here on the scene, where we have one of our mission specialists on the left-hand side that's uh, staying at the wheel, like controlling the, the wheel without touching it, just making sure that you know, everything is working as, uh, as expected. And uh, this uh, mission specialist is actually like, uh, responsible for taking control of the vehicle if they perceive that there's any notion of risk uh, associated with what the vehicle is, uh, is doing. And then on the right-hand side, we have a test operator that is in charge of monitoring these operations in real time, logging some of the behavior of the vehicle, and then uh, communicating with the uh, software engineers that are in charge of like, implementing some of the, the different uh, uh, software elements in that uh, architectural stack that we saw, that we saw earlier. Now, this gives you a sense of where things stand nowadays, nowadays but uh, as the technology matures, we're going to enter a situation where like, we're going to expand. And so this is where I, I believe that ATG and Uber actually have a, a, a very big advantage because they can, uh, we can combine the, the information that Uber is currently gathering in terms of like, the right hailing services with the underlying capabilities roadmap that ATG has uh, developed to instead of uh, having to like, tackle a broad like, market at once, focus the development in specific areas. And this is something that can be driven by several factors. In initial stages, it may be done based off, uh, on the underlying roadmap. So you may want to like, focus on specific areas here. Like you can see like, how this area is highlighted, because those areas may be rich in a certain particular scene that may help you accelerate your development. And then at later stages, you may consider other factors into play that have more of like a commercial aspect to them. Uh, now, this is just one, one area that want, I wanted to, um, to highlight. The other area that, uh, that I want to stress is the fact that this technology is going to gradually transition, like this is going to be a gradual development. And so it's really important to conceive what we call hybrid networks or hybrid operations. And those are operations in which you have uh, both self-driving vehicles and driver partners providing service uh, along, along the same market. Now, what's unique about this hybrid network, as this uh, started at, at a different point, is that, yeah, you're going to have this, this different operational domain. So you're going to have an, an initial operational domain where the self-driving vehicle is in operations, and you maybe uh, dispatch one of these uh, vehicles if you, if you make a request. But then there's other areas that may not be served by, by self-driving vehicles. And in, that, in those cases, you, you would be dispatched if you were to like, request a, an UberX. You would be dispatched a conventionally driven vehicle. So understanding the nuances of this type of hybrid operation is something that's really important and very rich from a transportation research standpoint. There's a lot of questions that come with this in terms of like how do you go about prioritizing city selection? 
once you once you've selected a city, how do you go about uh, determining the operational domain for the self-driving vehicles? There's more tactical questions that relate to the actual operation of these vehicles. How do you position them in real time by rebalancing them to, so that you can try to match the underlying demand? So you can see that these are kind of like a wide spectrum of very interesting questions that relate to transportation engineering. And so to give you more of a sense of uh, some of these questions, I'm going to devote the rest of my talk to focus on the notion of pickup and drop off zones, which is one of these uh, like very interesting questions within this realm of uh, hybrid operations. And so what are PDCs? PDCs are designated areas that are fully devoted. Or so like you can imagine, for example, a portion of the curve that gets like fully devoted to the picking, uh, picking up and dropping off of passengers. So there's no parking there. It's all devoted to, uh, to providing this type of ride hailing service. <coughs> and so why, why do we care about PDCs from a self-driving vehicle technology standpoint? Well, there's several factors at play. First, there's, uh, you have to note that we're developing this technology to be capable of operating with the existing infrastructure and to comply with the underlying road rules. And so this has different, imp uh, different uh, implications depending on the region that you are. And to give you a sense of what, what, I, mean, what I mean by that, for example, in Pennsylvania, uh, being able to, to conduct uh, what is a legal stop requires the vehicle to stop within six inches from the curve. And so that has certain implications on like the space that is required and so on. Now, that's one side of the equation, like the road rules and the SDB capabilities. The other side is the rider experience. Obviously, in, uh, in like the current service offerings, riders are accustomed to door-to-door -door service. And so understanding the implications of their willingness to walk and, uh, and so on is going to like play a, a key role in, uh, in planning for this like notion of like fixed uh, pickup and drop-off zones. Now, when we do that, we, we kind of like see this dual conundrum that we have here that we need to explore simultaneously. We have first the notion of what happens if we can stop everywhere, like what is, what, what's the implication of that separation between PDCs on the, uh, the reach of our service, like what is it that we can, uh, that we can cover? And then uh, also the, the role that the rider's willingness to, to walk is going to play here. So. How do we go about uh, understanding like the dynamics at play here? Well, we can we can construct like highly idealized scenarios that allow us to get uh, a sense of what the the physics uh, in, in the underlying service are. So, for example, in this particular case, you, we we can conceive a, a very regular grid of PDCs, pickup and drop-off zones, uh, that could be located every four to six blocks. This would be something that's reflective uh, of a low level of capabilities or uh, a market that's like very uh, restrictive in terms of like the parking regulation and so on. But you could also conceive like the other end of the spectrum, like a, a situation where you have PDCs at every single block. And uh, obviously like this is something that would be consistent with what you see nowadays with an UberX type service where like drivers like very much give uh, door to door service. Now you also have to layer in the willingness to walk that we were talking about. So in this particular case, the same thing, you would consider a gradation of uh, ranges, you would go from like a small willingness to walk that would be represented in a small catchment area that would be consistent with uh, an UberX type service, what, what an UberX rider would expect. Or you could conceive that riders may be willing to walk an extra amount of distance, maybe in exchange for like some, some sort of incentive, uh, something that would be consistent with an express pool type service. And so when we combine these two aspects, we can build a series of scenarios that would be similar to what we're seeing here. This is one of, the, one of these instances in which we have PDCs spaced every other block and a walking radius that would be consistent with UberX. Now we can then layer in the historical trip information that we have to get a sense of the reach of that service, like how, how, how many trips could actually be captured for, with a, a service uh, like that. And in this particular case, you can see that that is represented with the orange and uh, blue dots that represent uh, both the pickup uh, and drop-off points of individual trips. And then a trip in this particular scenario would be addressable if, if both the pickup and drop-off point happen to fall within the catchment area of these particular regions. And so when you uh, test the, the whole battery of uh, scenarios, this is what you end up, uh, when do, what you end up observing. Uh, here in this graph, we're representing the, the notion of PDZ spacing on the horizontal axis increasing uh, from left to right. And on the vertical axis, we have the, the catchment, the percentage of trips that are addressable by this type of uh, setup. 
And you can see how uh, there's six different curves here, each one of them representing a willingness to walk, going from the left-hand side, which is the low willingness to walk threshold, like uh, an UberX type style, all the way up to the high willi willingness to walk on system with, uh, with Uber pool or express pool. And so here you can, you can kind of get an intuitive sense that uh, like this trip addressability is going to be highly sensitive to both of these parameters. But to illustrate this notion, let's pick a specific scenario, the scenario that we, that we saw earlier, which is a PDC uh, spaced out every other block and UberX type radius. Now, if we consider an increase in the willingness to walk of only one block, only one block, we go from basically like a very, very low level of demand all the way up to like being able to catch most of the demand in this particular market with this particular system. So this has huge implications at both, uh, well, mostly at, at, at a product level. Like the, this is telling you that if you're capable to offer something so that you would encourage uh, riders to be willing to walk a little extra, all of a sudden the reach of your service is much much higher and so this can tie to like pricing mechanisms it can also tie to the design of the app so that you can provide like walking recommendations uh kind of like wayfinding so so that you make it easier for people to to reach your pdc's uh it can also have to do with like uh, the possibility of gamifying some of that uh walking so that you can encourage so it, it's all uh in trying to like get uh get people to to walk a little a little extra and then Similarly, like if, if you were to increase the density of these PDCs by decreasing the spacing, uh, just, just a block from every other block to a block, the same thing happens. It's not exactly as uh, critical of an effect, but it's also a pretty substantial effect that would allow the system to serve uh, much more many trips. And this again has like very uh, broad like policy implications. For example, if, if this system were to be uh, deployed in the context of shared rights, and this is uh, something that you wanted to, uh, to kind of like incentivize people from doing, well, you could conceive the possibility of allocating more, more space uh, to these stops. And so hopefully this gives you uh, a little bit of a, a recollection of the types of uh, questions that my team is currently working on. Uh, there's obviously like many other questions at play here uh, in this context of uh, hybrid uh, rideshare operations that combine self-driving vehicles and, uh, and driver partners. These are a couple of examples. Uh, you can look into the roles that individual capabilities plays at unlocking uh, the coverage or the potential for this, these types of services by you know, like understanding the effects of being able to do certain traffic maneuvers. Or you can, you can look into uh, questions that relate to infrastructure deployment. Like obviously, um, like this represents uh, self-driving technology, represents a shift away from the current operational paradigm that's quite asset light. And so understanding like the optimal deployment of infrastructure and implications around that is going to be paramount. And so before uh, ending, if there's one thing that I want to stress out of this lecture is the fact that to be able to address all of these questions effectively, we're going to have to uh, consider kind of a dual approach, uh, which is an approach that is based on uh, like big data, advanced analytics, data science tools, combined with an underlying fundamental understanding of the dynamics and physics at play of these transportation systems. And with that, uh, also highlight that uh, we have a summer internship open uh, for, uh, for, the, for the team. And so any of the students that uh, are interested in uh, working on these particular projects, feel free to check the link uh, at the bottom. And, and that's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to address any questions that you may have. Hi, Susan. Great talk, by the way. Thank you. So uh, just a, a question on your approach with the PDCs. So it seemed from your talk that you were applying that largely to SAVs, the shared automated vehicles. Are you looking at that in the context of, of transitioning into a shared automated vehicle? Because what happens when cities can't operate shared vehicles for a long time, right? I think the notion of Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. And in fact, uh, one of the images that I, that I used here comes from a study that the University of Washington uh, recently conducted, where they were looking at the uh, kind of like the merits of providing these PDCs. More so, so instead of looking at the, uh, the implications that on the like kind of reach of service, 
more so on the implications on congestion, because all of a sudden you have the possibility of, you know, like pulling to the curb, you're not uh, like obstructing traffic. And so, yeah, like there's certainly like more, more uh, aspects to it than just the one that I presented here. Yeah, but you're, yeah, you're right to say that this is the one that kind of like pertains to the realm of short autonomous vehicle operations. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think this is great. And obviously it's gonna work if everybody behaves exactly according to the rules. But as you showed with the driver initially, yeah. which may have been one driver, but may have been a specific time of day when nobody behaves according to mm -hmm. the rules. And so that individual might not have been able to follow the schedule. So that's your problem, isn't it? The, uh, the, uh, the sort of unpredictability. Yeah, no, that, that, yeah, that is, that is certainly one of, the, one of the big challenges at play, the fact that like, w the, these vehicles are actually interacting with humans. And so that poses difficulties in, difficulties in terms of uh, understanding like the, the expected behaviors. That, now, that said, this type of uh, technology, what, if, if there's one thing that it has, is that it, it's ever improving. And so the more data you collect, the more uh, like time it spends on the field, like observing the behavior of actors, the better it gets at like predicting that behavior. So even though it is certainly a challenge, I think that it is something that w over time it, uh, we'll be able to overcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. The, the value proposition comes from the unit economics. Uh, the fact that uh, when, once this technology scale is mature, there's the, the possibility of uh, reducing the underlying cost of operating these vehicles. And so that's, that's a huge, like in, imagine if instead of having to pay whatever, whatever it is that you are paying these days for an Uber, you could pay like half that price. Yeah. Yes, go. Thanks for the great lecture. Um, I actually found most interesting the, the beginning part of your PhD work with the, with the human in the loop, mm -hmm. not full self driving right. human in the loop. So you mentioned that you assembled a simulation model mm -hmm. that accounts for um, how, how the human drivers will react to the signaling you give them. Um, I find very interesting modeling human in the loops because we don't have a Newton's laws or Maxwell's right. equations for this, right? Can, can you tell us about how did you model the human in the loop there? And um, you found variations. So is there something we can learn about better modeling? Yeah, so th what we did was uh, we uh, overviewed like the performance of the control uh, so that we could build kind of like scatter plots that would give us like the tendencies of these humans. And obviously there was a ton of dispersion there. But we could kind of like get a, a, a very significant trend uh, that would tell us like how based on the, the like, and this, this pertains more on the like kind of like the floating bar, like cruising guidance that we were providing. So we could like assess how it is that the, the human would adapt their, their driving in between stations. What, where we didn't implement any uh, in, the, in that initial kind of like part of the graph, where we didn't implement any notion of variability was on the, on the compliance with the recommendation. So the, the kind of like the, the simulation results that you were seeing there were actually considering a fully compliant type of scenario. Yeah, yeah, and that's where like yeah. They were robots. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and that's why yeah that's why you see that kind of like gap in between what we were able to obtain. So then, if you want to model humans as humans in the sense of them, their responses being random, then is it? Do you basically have to assemble a probabilistic model where? Their action is conditioned upon. Yeah, I think. Th yeah, I think that you can go about it in several ways. You can build like distributions on how it is that they react to re the recommendation. And in fact, we saw so because we were able to analyze the the system with the low strength, uh, like the low control strength setup. We saw that when when you provide like lower um, magnitude uh, countdowns, humans are actually much more willing to to follow those recommendations. It is as it increases that like they start kind of the degrading in their behavior. So you can build distributions and then you can tie that to some underlying parameters that you could tweak to kind of like increase the spread of that distribution. Yeah, I think, I think that's how I, I would approach it. Now separate mathematics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. In your, your PDZ distances, why, yes. why not, why do you use a two norm instead of a one norm? I know, I know, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Carlos, Carlos, yeah, has called me uh, for for that. Yeah, I know. 
Yes, no, it was, it was just a matter of uh, convenience in this particular case. Yeah, but it is true, you, you, should, you should be using, uh, if, if you're like uh, laying out in, for example, a Manhattan uh, type grid, yeah, like the, the catchment area should actually be a rhomboid instead of what we were seeing here. So yes, that's a, that's a very good point, yeah. Yes. So that's a, yes, that, that is a very good question. And it is something that we always thought about as a possibility. But when we asked the agency to dive into the social demographics of the drivers, because they're highly unionized there in, uh, in Spain, they said no, no. <laughs> and so it's something that we didn't have a chance to explore. But I do think that there's probably something in there that, that relates to, yeah, your, uh, like how, uh, how used you are to interacting with like, uh, like technology that, that could play a role here, like how, trust, how trusting you are uh, from, from this type of like automated advice. Yeah, there's an old joke in England, in London, about a bus driver's convention. Nobody came for half an hour, then 23 people all came at once. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's, that's how they perceive the, the system as operating. That's right. Yes. Which which one? Yes, yeah. So that's yeah. That is historical uh, Uber service data that we are using there to inform like how those catchment curves are going to look like. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's yeah, I, I, I always kind of like, uh, I like this type of like really forward looking type of research where like you look at what it is the potential of the technology when it's like, like fully capable. Yeah, yeah. But I think that that, so, so yes, like to, to your point, yeah, like you could see a, a future in which like the, the need for uh, like vehicles would be much lower. And therefore, like you could see improvements in terms of like urban space allocation, there wouldn't be as much need for parking and so on. Yeah. Now. What I also want to say is that there's also a need to like look at the more like kind of like shorter range like scenarios that were, are going to be at play. And in, in that type of scenario, uh, I don't think that the the kind of like the the, the fleet sizing implications are going to be as uh, as uh, significant as you would have in a, in a system that's like fully capable, can be in operation for like longer periods of time. There's no yeah no need for you know like taking breaks or things like that nature. No, abs absolutely, and yeah, like this is something that's like highly relevant. In fact, like the, the possibility of looking at areas that are currently underserved, where like you could deploy this technology to increase the level of access that uh, you know, like people have within within a city. Yeah, this is something that we look into actively. Uh, now, when it comes to like choosing actual areas, uh, it may or may not be uh, applied. You know, like there may be other factors also at play that end up like taking precedence. But it is certainly something that we consider, we study, we analyze. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. The, the way that I see it. Yeah. So. 
Yes, I think I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that he, he's asking like how how do uh, new mobility like micro mobility options such as e-scooters or uh, like uh, shared bikes uh, influence the deployment of self-driving vehicle and the technology, and uh, how 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 do I see like these two systems kind of like interacting? No, if, uh, is that is that, a, is that okay? Okay, yeah. So I I think I think that uh, that's a very good question, and, and that it is. Like uh, the the more options you provide, like the better the the system is going to be in in a sense. And as you were saying, you were alluding to like this notion of uh, trip distance. I think that yeah, like these are uh, different systems that apply to different types of trips. And so for trips that are like shorter distance uh, in in an urban type of setting, I think that micro mobility options are great. They're affordable. They're like. Uh, um, very, I don't know, flexible in, in how you can go uh, with them. Obviously, like there are certain considerations in terms of like safety, use of the curve, and, and so on. But you know, like that that's one side of the equation. And then obviously, like this type of service would apply to yeah longer distances, something more uh, yeah aligned with like the type of service that you see nowadays with like an Uber, right, sh uh, shared ride uh, type of service. That is yes, yeah. That's a that's a very good point. It it I mean it applies to the notion of PDCs absolutely. That's a that's a great point. So this concept of multimodality actually improves. So this is yeah, like another possible idea here would be, uh, how do you go about lowering the friction, in you know like planning your trip so that you can use like multimodal options to access these these PDCs. That's that's actually yeah a very good idea. It also applies to transit as well. Obviously like having access to uh, you know like underlying transit stations so that you can pull more people. So. Yeah, it's all kind of like same same concept, but yeah, really good point. Okay, yeah, Mark. In your uh, sample screens, you have you said matched with an automated vehicle, mm -hmm. and then click if you'd like to. But, uh, yeah, you can opt out. Option. Yes. Are, have you been doing experiments to see how many people are going to? Yeah. Which of those? Yeah, we did w we did uh, a few experiments. Uh, like previously, and we actually didn't see like uh, like any major like opting out trends. Like it's like the yeah you would see like cancellation rates that are online or sorry in line with like what you would see in regular service. So I, I think that one of the key aspects of, of of this technology is actually like familiarity with it. And I believe that like once you have experienced this one time, like it like it becomes just like a regular option. So yeah, you don't see like. It's going to take a little bit in terms of like public education, like making sure that like people are familiar with the technology, they perceive it as safe, and so on. But once you're there, I, I don't expect to see like major differences. In that. Yes, Scott. Oh, Sumi. No, pu public transit is really, really cheap, so probably not. And actually, like public transit has a, a massive role to play in urban mobility. I mean, the kind of the, the, the potential in terms of consolidation of demand over time and space that transit, like uh, high frequency, like transit lines have, like no, no other mode can actually provide that. So transit is here to stay. We're not competing with transit. In fact, if something, we're going to try to like complement it. And so. The, the, the other thing um, that I think it's, uh, it's relevant to note here is that I think what's more important here is actually considering the notion of replacing the current private vehicle paradigm. And that is something that I think it's really relevant and kind of ties with this idea of uh, lowering the, the, the fleet size that you need to like fulfill a certain level of mobility in an urban environment. So I think that, yeah, as the technology matures, that's kind of like the, the next, uh, next barrier, the next level. It's like trying to get to that point where like you can have a, an option that's like convenient enough and economically economical enough to actually compete with private vehicle ownership. Yes. Mm. Yes. Your systems take weather into account. I would think rain or snow is going to stylistically affect the system. Mm -hmm. Do you sense it directly, or would you use the weather tool? Or 
That's a, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, weather definitely plays a role and it's tied to the underlying like vehicle capabilities. So like there's environmental factors at play. And obviously like over time, we're intending the technology to operate in all sorts of conditions. But right now there's like limitations. Obviously if you are in a blizzard uh, and there's like uh, massive amounts of snow coming down, some of these sensors are not gonna work as you would expect. And so that has implications. So yeah, there's like mechanisms that we have uh, in play to be able to like monitor weather conditions in real time and then like if we're like conducting field test operations we'll take that into account and stop them so, uh, plus you have the human operator operators right now that give you that extra layer of uh, robustness yeah oh sorry Yeah, that's that's a that's an interesting and futuristic question. Uh, like right now, yeah, I think that th there's like sometimes there's a tendency to like conflate the notion of autom automated technology and connected technology. And I think that it is the connected portion where like you can coordinate the motion of you know like these vehicles that would enable to unlock like higher capacities for the underlying infrastructure. And yeah, in th in that type of setting, you could devote that infrastructure to other alternative modes. Now. Within the current context, that's uh, going to take some time, but I could totally see a future like that. Yeah, and it would be, it would be great. Yeah. Yes, go. So um, we have a lot of students here, and I think one of the important things that we want to teach our students is about responsible use of technology and ways things can, can go wrong if we don't think about it. And I think you're a great example of someone who can think both ways. So with respect to um, these, these PEs, well, self-driving cars first. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key benefits is it can provide mobility to people who otherwise do not have because of disability mm -hmm. and elderly. So I'm wondering with these pickup, with these PDZs, these pickup and drop-off zones, um, now we now we're asking people to walk a little bit, right? So the first slice of those who are not served are those precisely a population that we are trying to serve and provide mobility and access to. Mm -hmm. Has that come up in the conversation, or, or am I not? No, no, you are, no, it's, it, yeah, it could be an unintended consequence in this particular case. It's so, something that you would hope to resolve as the technology matures and you increase the level of uh, capabilities and, uh, you know, like the reach so that you can place like this PDCs closer together and, and, and increase the, uh, the access. Yes, but it, it will certainly have like some implications uh, initially. Yes. Thank you, Juan. Cool. Wonderful. All right. Thank you.